Welcome back, guys. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be discussing uh, the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. Um, the uh, Nazi party is actually a nickname uh, for the uh, political party in Germany known as the NSDAP or uh, the National Socialist German Workers Party. Um, the National Socialist German Workers Party is really for, uh, you know, the, the time period is a very small political party without a lot of influence uh, until, uh, you know, Hitler takes it over. Uh, so we're going to start to talk about the uh, conditions in Germany under which uh, Hitler is going to be able to, uh, you know, build the Nazi party. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what the goals and aims of the uh, the Nazi uh, party were. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, unlike Mussolini in Italy, um, Hitler's going to get elected. He's not going to stage a coup uh, to come to power, although he will attempt one. Uh, it will not be successful. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what you have to understand is that, you know, Germany in, you know, the uh, post-World War I era is actually not very dissimilar to uh, the way America is today. Uh, you know, it's one of the most democratic nations on the planet. Uh, the, their government is known as the Weimar government. Um, the Weimar Republic, you know, is the, the better way to say it. And uh, at the time, they are uh, significantly more democratic than the United States is at the time. Uh, you know, in 1918, the, the Weimars, uh, one of the most tolerant governments on the planet, uh, they've already given women the right to vote, which we know America has not done uh, in 1918. America is two years off from that. Um, the Weimar uh, has, you know, some of the least restrictive laws for immigrants. Uh, and so Jews are actually, uh, you know, uh, you know, early in the, the Weimar, uh, Jews are actually a protected class in, uh, in Germany. Uh, they're allowed to uh, take different types of employment that they wouldn't normally get in other European countries. Uh, you see that they will be dominating the, uh, you know, not just, uh, you know, the financial industry, which we've talked about before in previous uh, lectures and how that arose and how the stereotypes of, you know, uh, Jews came about because of that. Uh, and uh, there, but the, the Jews are also going to uh, be dominating the academic fields uh, in, in Germany and, and are really kind of thriving in this very tolerant society. Uh, Germany in 1918 is also uh, what we would consider today to be a welfare state, uh, which means uh, that their social protections, uh, you know, economic protections for people within Germany. Uh, they have, uh, you know, government health insurance plans uh, and things of that uh, and things of that nature. And so Germany is kind of this thriving, uh, you know, uh, country. It's got one of the highest literacy rates. Uh, so, you know, people are, uh, you know, educated, they, they can read. Um, and their economy, you know, uh, is is you know very industrial, uh, and uh, you know it's not doing well in 1918 because of you know the you know and and through the the 20s and 30s, uh, it's not going to be doing so great uh, because of the Great Depression. But it's got the bones of a good economy. Uh, you know, they uh, uh, have the infrastructure and actually have a decent amount of resources in the River Valley to thrive. So. Uh, the question then becomes if Germany is this, you know, very tolerant society, um, you know, they uh, are democratic with a president, uh, a two house parliament. And so there's, uh, you know, the, the Reichstag is their uh, version of Congress. How is it then that, that Hitler is going to be able to rise to power in such a tolerant uh, society? Um, well, it's in large part because even though the Weimar is, uh, you know, one of these, you know, kind of liberal Western democratic societies, it is very unpopular. 
Uh, it's unpopular because the uh, of the Treaty of Versailles. The, you know, there the Weimar's blamed for uh, kind of all these bad things that have happened in Germany, which is it's not fair. Uh, you know, the, the Weimar didn't cause the uh, Navy to mutiny uh, and, uh, you know, to they're just kind of thrust in this situation, uh, you know, this leadership role within Germany. Uh, but, you know, they're the ones that that are following the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. And so uh, we see that the Germans are going to uh, be blaming them because of uh, you know, all these negative things that happened with the Treaty of Versailles, the war guilt clause, uh, you know, the German people are a proud people. And, uh, you know, they don't think it's fair that they should take all the blame for the war when they know that it's not entirely their fault. You know, many countries had a hand in uh, the cause of World War One. Uh, we're going to see, uh, you know, the reparations payments that are made necessary because of the Treaty of Versailles are absolutely devastating the German economy. You know, one of the historically strongest economies uh, in modern Europe. Uh, you know, the uh, to add insult to injury, they're limited. They've limited the military to a hundred thousand person military, uh, which you know is basically a large police force. And so, you know, later when Germany's incapable of making reparation payments to France, France will just essentially march into the resource rich Ruhr Valley and just take what they want uh, as payment. And, you know, the Weimar is seen as uh, essentially impotent to stop it. So um, who are uh, the uh, Nazi Party uh, supporters? Uh, well, uh, the supporters of the the nazi movement are uh going to be people that are strongly nationalistic right uh they're going to believe in that germany uh you know has you know historically been a you know a a great um if not country because it's a relatively new country uh, the germanic people and the aryan people are you know a, a great people uh they uh believe in germany and are extremely patriotic you know and they're afraid uh these people are afraid of the depression uh, they're afraid of uh, communism that's rising uh not only in germany but clearly uh you know just to the east in the soviet union they're afraid that uh you know, that poor, the poor masses are going to turn to communism. Uh, and when they turn to communism, you know, wealth redistribution will uh, take away the, you know, all the things that the middle class has worked so hard for. Uh, and so they want to turn to, you know, anybody uh, who is willing to say that they're going to stand up for the German people and uh, protect them from communism. And the Nazi party is going to be one of the first parties, uh, political parties in uh, Germany uh, to stand up and say, we think you're great German people uh, and we will protect you from uh, the threat of communism. Right. Um, the major supporters are going to be, uh, you know, mostly the uh, middle class, uh, some members of the, the peasantry that, uh, you know, communism doesn't appeal to, uh, but they'll get most of their support from the middle class. Uh, and again, uh, in large part because they are the middle class is terrified. You know, they've worked their whole lives to, you know, uh, gain some uh economic standard of living, and they're afraid that either through the depression or through communist redistribution, uh, that they're going to see all their progress uh, disappear. Uh, they're going to be mostly Protestant. Uh, the uh, Nazi party um, is, you know, kind of has a love-hate relationship with uh, the Catholic Church, uh, you know, not liking the idea that, uh, you know, the German people would hold anything higher than the state. Um, you know, Catholics uh, tend to, uh, you know, be discriminated against because uh, of the belief that somehow Catholics are more loyal to the Pope uh, than they are to their country. Uh, <clears throat> And so uh, now we're going to move on and start to talk uh, about uh, Adolf Hitler and uh, how Adolf Hitler uh, ends up kind of taking control over the uh, NSDAP. Well, uh, Hitler is uh, 
interestingly enough, uh, you know, he, as a, a young boy, uh, he is not really interested in the military. Uh, he wants, he's an aspiring artist. As a matter of fact, the picture that you're looking at right now uh, is a painting done by a young Adolf Hitler. Um, Hitler, as a young boy, uh, applies to art school. And uh, as uh, you know, a, a young man moves to uh, Vienna to pursue a career in the arts. And so there's been lots of speculation about Adolf Hitler about, oh man, if he just would have made it as a successful artist, maybe we wouldn't have had the Holocaust. Um, I would probably make a different argument. I think his time in Vienna uh, helped to radicalize him against the Jews. Uh, see, uh, Vienna and the Vienna Art School, where he applied, uh, is uh, the city of Vienna is one of the most anti-Semitic cities in the world. Uh, anti-Semitic uh, means uh, anti-traveling people. So it can really mean anti-Jew, anti-Gypsy, anti-Arab. Uh, but because of Adolf Hitler, uh, it really today means anti-Jewish. And so the, the city of Vienna is one of the most anti-Jewish uh, cities in uh, the world. And, you know, Hitler just loves Vienna. He loves uh, spending all day at the cafes, uh, talking about art and politics. Uh, it's a really kind of bohemian lifestyle. Think of when I say bohemian, think of like hippies before hippies, um, you know, uh, people, you know, artists kind of lounging around, uh, you know, drinking coffee all day. Uh, Hitler doesn't drink. Uh, he's a teetotaler, so no drugs, uh, no alcohol, uh, but he likes that artistic environment. As a matter of fact, uh, Hitler takes that even a step further. Uh, he doesn't eat meat. He's a vegetarian. A lot of people are uh, surprised by that. Somebody who could, you know, ruthlessly kill millions of people um, doesn't eat meat. Uh, but anyway, uh, so Hitler is, uh, you know, in Vienna living up this like artists kind of lifestyle. And because the city is so anti-Semitic, he's hearing, um, chirping about, you know, Jewish conspiracies and they control the finances. He hears rumors that the mutiny, the Navy mutiny that got the you know, uh, Germany out of World War One was really a Jewish conspiracy. And he starts to believe these things. And as a matter of fact, uh, quite a few Germans actually do. Uh, you have to remember from their perspective, they thought they were winning World War One, right? Uh, no fighting on German territory the entire war. Uh, all the fighting was done, you know, in Russia, Belgium, France. Uh, you know, when, when the German people quit, uh, you know, they had occupied uh, large portions of those other countries. And so they thought they were winning. And then all of a sudden this mutiny happens and they've lost now and they're they're told they're losers and they're being punished for that. Uh, they think, well, that can't be us. That can't be our fault. We were winning. And so, uh, you know, the, the Jewish conspiracy theory is something that Hitler really buys into. Um, and then he, while in Vienna, he gets rejected from the Vienna Art School. Um, you know, it's one of the premier art schools in the world. And, you know, Hitler, although I mean, it, looking at this painting, it's definitely more ta uh, talented than something I could produce, uh, but it's just not good enough. Uh, one of his, uh, you know, art critics, uh, the, the people uh, that are, you know, the art school teachers that are evaluating his work actually says, uh, you know, uh, makes a remark that Hitler has a hard time painting people's faces. A lot of people have, um, you know, speculated that that's because Hitler has no empathy. I, there's no way to know that for sure. Um, I would suggest that it's probably just faces are hard to paint. Uh, but anyway, he gets rejected. Uh, and, you know, like I said earlier, the, you know, the Jewish people have um, a reputation as being, um, you know, in the upper echelons of academia. And so Hitler, uh, you know, we know that he really kind of blames Jews for um, controlling academia and for his rejection from art school. And so, uh, you know, 
a, a lot of people say that this is the very beginnings of his ideas about, uh, you know, genocide against the Jews. I don't know that there's actually any evidence for that, uh, you know, but uh, it is certainly uh, something that he is uh, going to uh, complain about. So uh, Hitler is a veteran of World War I. Uh, he is actually one of the people to survive the Treaty of Versailles. So he's going to uh, be able to keep his job in the military uh, even after they limit the military to 100,000 uh, people. Um, he's got this kind of uh, you know nondescript background. He didn't really stand out during World War I, didn't do anything uh, very special. Uh, we know that by this point he is uh, pretty anti-Semitic, uh, not you know, uh, um, not liking the the Jewish people. Um, and he becomes one of the first recruits of the Nazi party. Um, so what happens is, and the reason why Hitler is able to keep his job with the uh, German military is because he's a, uh, essentially he's a spy. And so in the early days of the Weimar Republic, there's really this fear that, uh, that there's going to be all these coups and that the government is going to be overthrown. And so the government actually is sending in members of the military to spy on political rallies to make sure that these rallies aren't becoming too radicalized. And so, um, you know, Hitler is actually sent, and this is crazy, uh, Hitler's actually sent by the government to go spy on one of the early meetings of the NSDAP or the Nazi party. And when he shows up, he's, you know, standing in the background, getting, you know, writing his report. Uh, and he actually kind of likes what he hears. Uh, these members of the NSDAP are mostly German World War I vets, and they're talking about how great the German people are and how the German people were winning the war. And that if Germany wants to be successful, it needs to be strong. It needs to, um, you know, remember its, you know, its nationalistic roots. Uh, it needs to throw off the chains of the Treaty of Versailles. And Hitler's listening to all this and he likes it. He also knows that he's about to lose his job. Uh, you know, the German military told him from the very beginning that his job as a spy is essentially a uh, short term gig. And so he's looking for something to do and uh, he's hearing you know, the Nazi party rhetoric. And he's saying, I think I can be a part of this organization. And so uh, he, uh, when he leaves his job as a part of the military, uh, he joins up with the, uh, the NSDAP or the Nazis. And uh, very quickly, he's, he starts to say, look, this is a, you know, a very small political party. It's got, I mean, less than 1% of the vote in national elections. And, you know, Hitler says, I, I think I can change that. Uh, you know, uh, Hitler is a great public speaker. Uh, and so he starts to, you know, uh, make himself a representative of the, the Nazi party. Um, he, uh, you know, is just this hypnotic speaker. Um, he's extremely emotional. Uh, he, you know, uh, and so the Nazi party uses him for that. He's not like the great thinker of the Nazi party. He didn't invent the party. He didn't really invent uh, the ideology of the party, uh, but he is going to effectively communicate that. And so you see that he will um, uh, quickly be able to kind of uh, rise up the ranks of the Nazi party uh, and <coughs> grow the party both um, in terms of numbers of people involved and uh, fundraising for, uh, for the party. So uh, what is it that uh, is appealing about Hitler uh, to the German people? Well, one, he's going to emphasize German nationalism, right? Uh, he's going to tell the people really kind of what they want to hear. Everybody wants to be told they're great, right? And uh, particularly when you're having a bad day. And Germany's having a whole lot of bad days after World War I. And Hitler comes by and he's, he, he just says, 
German people, you're great people. Um, you know, you are one of the most educated countries in the world. You are one of the most industrious countries in the world. You used to be the richest country in the world. You used to have one of the best militaries in the world. You were, we were this great power and we can be that again. That is who you are. The only reason that you're not at the top right now is because people are out to get you. The Jews are out to get you. They betrayed you. Uh, with the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the, <clears throat> they've infiltrated the Weimar Republic. Uh, they're the ones that are keeping you down. The Western powers are keeping you down, right? Uh, and uh, with this Treaty of Versailles, and he essentially says that if the Nazi party is in power, we won't abide by the treaty anymore and we will restore you to what you remember what you were, right? I mean, like you will restore you to the power that we were just, you know, uh, you know, a few short years ago. And so, uh, you know, this is going to be a message that is going to resonate with all kinds of different uh, German people. Um, you know, the repealing of the treaty that which essentially says, <coughs> You know, uh, everything is Germany's fault. So there's a psychological victory there uh, that, you know, he is going to advocate to stop paying back rep uh, reparations. And he plans to put people back to work by rebuilding the German military, which is not just employing soldiers, right? But if you're going to remilitarize, he needs weapons again, too. So uh, it means more soldiers. It means more people in factories building tanks and uh, at this point, airplanes and submarines and boots. It means, you know, uh, more farmers growing food for the soldiers, you know, uh, you know, the textile industry to make uh, uniforms and parachutes and all the things that are necessary. Uh, and so he essentially is, uh, you know, promising to rebuild the, the economy through uh, rebuilding the military, which would require a repeal of the dreaded Treaty of Versailles. Uh, and then one of the, the biggest things that he's, he does is he's going to promise to protect the German people from communism. Now, we've talked about this a little bit earlier uh, in the lecture, uh, but this is really important. And he doesn't just say he's going to protect them. He actually goes out and does it. Uh, he will send out uh, Nazi supporters to communist rallies to beat up communists. Uh, to chase them out of neighborhoods. Um, he actively is uh, using the uh, Nazi party resources uh, to physically go after the communists. And see, what's interesting about that is Hitler doesn't actually have a problem with, uh, you know, the idea of totalitarian dictatorships. He doesn't have a problem with the government being in control of the economy because when he gets into power, he's going to establish a totalitarian dictatorship. He's going to establish control over the economy. Uh, what he has a problem with is uh, simply the idea that the problems that a country have are about rich versus poor. Uh, and that's what communism is all about. It's the, that all the problems in society are because the rich are taking advantage of the poor. Uh, Hitler says, no, that's wrong. Uh, he says, it's uh, not about rich versus poor, it's about race. It's that the Aryan race is the superior race and that it's the inferior races that are keeping the Aryan race down. And so he hates communists, not because of some government philosophy, but because of uh, the philosophy of the root of the problems in society. And so he's going to bill uh, the Nazi party as the opposite of the communist party. He's going to convince German uh, all across Germany, that the Nazis are the exact opposite of the communists. Um, when in almost every single way, the Nazis and the communists are extremely similar, uh, with really only one major difference. And that major difference is the emphasis of race instead of the emphasis of class. Uh, that's how the Nazi party gets the um, reputation for being a right-wing uh, philosophy when, you know, in fact, the, the only real trait uh, that you can associate uh, the, the Nazi party with that is, tends to be right wing is a sense of patriotism and nationalism. Uh, you know, the Nazis take that to, to quite the extreme. Um, and so uh, he builds the Nazi party as the opposite of the communists. And then he uses Nazis to beat up communists. 
And so uh, the middle class uh, starts to flock uh, to the Nazi party because of that. Um, and then he just essentially tells all the Germans who are majority Aryan that they are the master race, that they are, uh, you know, he superior. And he, and he uses the modern day science to try and prove that, right? I mean, we're, we're still living in a world that believes in social Darwinism. Uh, and so uh, he's essentially taking a social Darwinistic approach uh, to, uh, you know, race. And he says, you know, the Aryans are at the top, <coughs> excuse me. All right. Uh, and so, uh, the Nazi party in, a, you know, relatively short amount of time, uh, is going to go from being one of the smallest, uh, German political parties, uh, to the, uh, one of the largest, uh, German political parties. And, you know, uh, it doesn't exactly happen overnight. It, it takes, uh, you know, years uh, and years of planning with uh, between, you know, Adolf Hitler and, uh, you know, Joseph Goebbels, uh, who we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but eventually, uh, you know, after a failed coup and, um, you know, uh, uh, some minor election wins, eventually he's going to get some major election wins. Uh, and is going to take over the country of Germany. <coughs> Sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. So uh, what are uh, Hitler's political views? Well, uh, really, most things uh, just evolve around race. Uh, you know, it's this idea that there's a racial hierarchy and that if the Aryans can... Um, you know, uh, are, are left on their own and are not being dragged down by these inferior races that, uh, you know, the, uh, the German people will be successful. And so uh, everything uh, that Hitler talks about is uh, going to be in the context of race. Um, He's going to start to promote a pan-German ideology. Uh, not all Germans live in Germany. And so uh, he very quickly is going to start to talk about uniting the Germanic people. Uh, there are German people living in, you know, uh, Austria. There are German people living in uh, the, you know, Czech Republic and, and what's known as the Sudetenland. Uh, you know, there's uh, German people in kind of the demilitarized Rhineland zone on the border of uh, Germany and France. Uh, and he's going to start to talk about uniting all Germans uh, together. Um, and again, uh, you know, just so you can get it down in your notes, uh, he is very hostile to the idea of, uh, of Marxism. Uh, Marxism is just another way of saying uh, communism. Uh, you know, he... Uh, really struggles uh with uh you know with with communism and the idea of communism all right uh well uh that's hitler's uh political views uh that's where we're going to uh leave off today uh tomorrow we're going to uh pick up and actually start to talk about uh the uh hitler's failed attempt at a coup and then uh we'll actually go about electing hitler in uh, germany all right thank you very much and i will talk to you tomorrow